Today I will teach on an interesting subject found in the book of Romans. When one studies the book of Romans, it doesn't take us long to realize that the book of Romans makes a distinction between the spirit and the soul. It talks about the spirit man being saved, and it talks about the bringing the soul into subjection, bringing the body into subjection so that you can walk a holy life before God. Many religions don't know the difference. This is why there is so much confusion today. For the most religious people believe that if you live a godly life or so-called godly life, then you are a Christian. That is not true. To become a Christian, you have to become a child of God, accepted by Him through the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is the blood of Christ so important? Because God uses the blood of Jesus as a vehicle to make us acceptable to God. The, by, the book of Romans talks about the righteousness of God. And today I want to teach on this subject. But before I get into this message, I will ask the Lord to bless us. Heavenly Father, I come before you in Jesus' name, and I pray, O oh God, that you will bless the message today. I ask that you will enlighten the hearts of the listeners today so that they will be able to rejoice in their salvation. I pray for those who are threatened down by Satan's lies, O oh God, that they will be able to study the book of Romans and realize that they have become a new creation in Christ once they have placed their trust for salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will open hearts and minds today, O God. I ask you to bless this message in Jesus' name. Amen. When one studies the book of Romans, it becomes confusing unless you understand what God is trying to tell us. First of all, let's cover the subject of the righteousness of God. For God demands a total righteousness to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The Apostle Paul writes us in Romans chapter 10 that the Jews were ignorant of God's righteousness. They were ignorant of the righteousness that God demanded for them to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And this is why they went about to establish their own righteousness, because they were ignorant. They did not understand the righteousness that God demanded. And this is the problem with most really, with all religious people today. They do not understand the righteousness that God demands for a person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is why they will go about to establish their own righteousness. They will erect laws, rules, and regulations how to become righteous with God. And thus, in the end, they will miss the mark regardless how well-meaning they were, regardless how they tried to please God. Let me try to explain to you what God means by His righteousness. For to become righteous as God, you cannot afford to sin once. If you sin once, even an evil thought or or a little bit of a thought that is not pleasing to God, if you do that once, then you miss heaven. You cannot afford to have one little bit of unrighteousness in you. 
So I'm painting you a picture here that it is impossible for you to attain that righteousness by your own efforts. So how do you get that righteousness? You turn to Jesus Christ for your salvation. You accept His righteousness for yourself and then you give your sins to Him. The Bible teaches in Romans chapter 3 very clearly that the righteousness of God is faith in Jesus Christ. Do you understand here what I am telling you? We cannot achieve the righteousness of God by our efforts. It has to be given us. For we cannot afford to be unrighteous for one split second. If we are unrighteous for one split second, and if we die in that instant, we are in the lake of fire. So once Jesus gives you his righteousness, it is a done deal. It will last throughout eternity. You will never get more righteous even after a million years in heaven. Once you receive the righteousness of Christ by placing your faith in Christ, you become pure and holy. God then looks at you and sees the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what does the Bible mean in, in chapter 12 of Romans? This is where a lot of religions, they, that's where they make the mistake, and that's where confusion comes in. For many religions will th try through good efforts, through godly living, through some good deeds that they're doing, they will try to please God and bring about their righteousness. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it the Apostle Paul tells us, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Very interesting, the choice of words that the Apostle Paul used. He tells us once you become a Christian, then you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is only reasonable for you to do once you become a Christian. If godly living would be your salvation, he would not use the word reasonable here. He would tell us, I beseech you, brethren, you better present your, live, or your body a living sacrifice to God or else. No, this is not what he's saying. He is telling us, once you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, once you become a new creation in Christ, once you become holy and pure and perfect in God's eyes, then it is your reasonable service to present your body a living sacrifice for your God. And it tells us, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He tells us after, after we become born again, after we become perfect, after we have received the righteousness of God, then we start to renew our minds. That's when we start to do what is the perfect will of God. Oh, how beautiful the word of God is. Once you start to understand it correctly, then it becomes easy to follow the Lord Jesus Christ because you know you don't have to worry about your salvation anymore if you fail. Sure, we will fail, regardless how we try. 
we will fail when it comes to following the things of God that God wants us to do. And you know what sometimes what I feel? If a person fails and he sees that he fails, he will say, Lord, accept me a sinner. I am a failure. I can do nothing without you. This is when God draws close to a person and a, a, a lifetime of fellowship and joy it, it starts to happen between God and the one whom he has saved from his sin. Yes, dear friends, this is what I'm trying to tell you. Do not mix religion, good works with salvation. This is the problem with all religions. And alas, far too many Christians are caught in the same trap. They seem to think if they don't, present their bodies a living sacrifice constantly to God, then they will lose their salvation. And then they become depressed and powerless as far as God's work is concerned. Yes, the believer who loves Jesus, who understands the things of God, who understands that he is saved through the blood of Christ, that he is kept by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. He can fall seven times and get up and keep going. I'm not condoning sin here or failure, but I am telling you, for those of you who have fallen into the trap of Satan, where Satan is bombarding you all the time with your failings, don't worry about it. You are saved. You are a child of the King. Just get up and walk for your Lord. Tell people about the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. For you see, dear precious believers, this is the last commandment the Lord left us. In Mark, the last chapter, it tells us, Go you into all all the world and preach this precious gospel and let me tell you this gospel is precious this is the vehicle that god has used ha has proclaimed that will save the world from its sin this is what god is using to give us eternal life and what is it it is believing in jesus for the remission of our sins. Yes, Jesus is the only one that can redeem us from the powers of darkness. It is us placing our faith in his blood sacrifice, which he shed on the cross for us 2,000 years ago. The blood is still as powerful today as it was the day it was shed. Yes, in the Old Testament, the Jewish people had to bring a sheep or a lamb for the sacrificing for their sin. The blood had to be spilled and it covered them for a time. But then the real sacrifice came, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he was crucified for us. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweated blood for us to take away our sin. So if Jesus did all that for us, why cannot we present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice unto God? This is our reasonable service. But I want to warn every believer here or every religious person, if you are trying to present your body a living sacrifice to somehow gain eternal life, then you are an abomination to the Lord God. This is the warning that I want to leave with anybody who is within the sound of my voice. I will say it again. If you are presenting your body as a living sacrifice, 
to God so that you can somehow gain eternal life. You are an abomination to the Lord God and you are spitting in His eye. You are rejecting His sacrifice that He performed for you to save your soul. And you will have to be rejected and you will have to spend your eternity in the lake of fire. Take it serious to try to gain eternal life through some effort or some sacrificing of yourself is an abomination to the Lord God and you will be rejected. But for those of us who recognize that we are lost, that we are sinners, for those of us who recognize that we need a Savior and who accept that Savior, and once we become pure and holy in the eyes of God. And then we start to present our bodies as living sacrifices to God. This is a perfume in the nostrils of God. And at the judgment seat of Christ, He will reward us richly. The Lord will open your heart and your mind to this awesome truth and bless you. Amen.